Hi everybody, thanks very much. I'm, uh, I feel very privileged. This is the largest group of professionals that I've had the privilege of speaking to. Um, I'm glad you all came out and I hope it's worth it for you. So, uh, I was invited to give this talk on the basis of a somewhat longer one I gave last year, so I've had to condense it down somewhat. I hope I keep on time, Greg's gonna help me with that, and we got lots of ground to cover. I wanna talk to you about some of the background of who we are at Halberton Forest, and the particular context that we're coming from with partial harvesting and hardwoods in Ontario. Um, and then from that, how do we end up trying to apply a regular shelter wood, and what are some of the problems we've faced in both implementing the system and also securing buy-in from stakeholders, not least the Ministry of Natural Resources. And uh, how we're trying to square that circle, what Halliburton Forest is doing on the ground, our principles for its application. Um, I great debt to lots of people, including uh, Steve and Patricia in this room, and thanks to them we get to skip a couple of slides. So, um, as we go through this, I'd like you to bear some sort of theses in mind. And first, that's what a regular shelter wood is, what it represents to you really depends on where you've come from. Um, my title about constraining a regular shelter wood really only makes sense, I think, in the Ontario context if you're pulling from you know, truly uniform practices for regenerating black cherry and um, Pennsylvania, what I'm proposing might still seem extremely permissive. So context is, is everything. And because of that, there's a lot of confusion about what a regular shelter wood is, what it's supposed to be, how you do it, and we need to be a lot more specific when we're describing and prescribing a regular shelter wood system uh, treat, kinds of treatments, stages of management, everything else. And the more specific and the more constrained we can get with a regular shelter wood, the more it's going to look like it's conventional alternative. So I want to highlight some examples of that. Um, but differences remain. This whole idea of regular shelter wood, uh, the, there are differences there. They might sometimes be subtle or specific or cultural, but they're worth pushing forward with. And I hope to briefly make that case. So, Halberton Forest, this is McDonald Lake at Halberton Forest. Um, we mostly manage maple, and I'm going to be talking about maple for the context of this presentation. Uh, we are a private, sustainable, multi-use forest management company. We uh, directly own and manage about 100,000 acres of mostly hardwood in central Ontario. Uh, we have an associated sawmill that's fed from the annual harvest off of that timberland. And we're in cottage country, we have an extensive tourism business on the same property. It's almost 50% of the revenue for this sort of core freehold associated business. We do other things too, but that's the most important for this presentation. And, but being private, I need to emphasize that we're a business. We need our timberland to provide returns. And when we arrive at a regular shelter wood, it's an economic solution to a set of problems. We're not necessarily doing it to rehabilitate degraded stands or to better emulate natural disturbances. We think we can grow better timber this way. Um, a final thing about Halburn Forest is our unofficial motto. We don't have it figured out. Uh, there are many folks in Ontario who believe tolerant hardwood silviculture is figured out, and therefore we haven't substantially changed our guides since 1983. Um, I don't think Tony actually believes that hardwood silviculture is figured out. He wanted to talk about beech bark disease and a regular shelter wood actually in this presentation. Um, but we feel lucky to be on private land where we can experiment and adapt somewhat freely. Okay, so what is the Ontario status quo? And that is single tree selection is the best system. Um, the, the belief is that it provides the best economic returns, continued availability of high quality forest products. And what the result of that is it is applied anywhere it can be. If a stand meets the eligibility criteria for selection, you do selection. Um, if you're not doing selection, if your stand doesn't meet the eligibility criteria, the alternative is uniform shelter wood. Um, in Ontario, that looks like one regeneration cut and probably two removal cuts, a first removal and a final removal cut. Uh, those cuts are often spaced decades apart, and the total rotation is going to be 120 years in practice. That's a nominal rotation, and practice is probably going to be substantially more than that. And there's generous overstory retention throughout the system, but also in the final removals, the uh, residual BA of at least six meters squared in the final removal. For those of you who are paying attention to Patricia, uh, excuse me, Patricia and Steve's presentation, that sounds a lot like extended irregular, does it not? So we'll come back to that in later. Oh yeah, it's Ontario. Everything is tree marked by a combination of regulation and custom. Everything is tree marked. So what we've arrived at is that many stands that were previously treated with single tree selection 
you, we've come back to them 20, 30 years later, maybe after one or two intervals, they no longer meet the eligibility criteria for single tree selection. They used to, for various reasons, they no longer do. And we're looking to do something different with these stands. But because they've been treated with this history of partial harvesting and disturbance, they're highly irregular. And because they don't meet the single tree selection criteria, they're patchy and low quality. And that makes it awkward to apply the conventional alternative of uniform shelter. Here's an example. Uh, this is on our property. This is the Red Trail. And this was harvested with single tree selection back in the 90s. We went back to it, did not meet the eligibility criteria. And this is what it looks like after a different partial harvesting system was applied. Um, so the conventional alternative would be to switch to uniform shelter wood. The criticisms of uniform shelter wood have now been well described. And the interest is in doing something different in particular, which can respond to the within stand variability that's encountered. So I'll skip this next slide. Um, there have been other approaches and modifications made to the, to the uniform system or to single tree selection to try to adapt to this variability. One of them, probably the most common, is on the Bancroft Menon Forest. The Bancroft Menon is a uh, crown forest that's adjacent to us, and so we get to steal a lot of ideas from each other. They've been practicing what they have called a perpetual seed cut. This is a uniform shelter wood cut, um, sorry, uniform shelter wood regeneration cut that's implemented basically the same way each time. Over the course of about 35 years, you are doing renewal, harvesting, and thinning simultaneously. What does that sound like to anybody in the room? Um, there are other things too, the emphasis on group openings to favor mid tolerances increased in importance since about the 90s. So people have recognized the shortcomings, have tried to adapt to them. But really what's going on is since Patricia Raymond's article started making the rounds within my network, it, it said like, oh, let's take this idea and run with it further. Let's stop making modifications around the edges of the system and, and dive in full steam. Um, really, one of the appeals, there's a bunch of appeals for why switch all the way to calling this thing a regular shelter wood. And I don't want to undersell this first most important point, which is that it feels like the right thing to do. As a tree marker, you're trained on what uniform shelter wood is supposed to look like in your silviculture guide, and then you go in, in the woods and it looks nothing like it at all. And you, your body recoils at putting the paint on these trees in a way that doesn't feel like it's matching the intention of the system. And finding a piece of vocabulary that that accurate, seems to more accurately describe what you're doing, whether you're a tree marker or machine operator, is empowering and liberating, and it's exciting to find something that fits and to run with it. It'll, it is, uh, satisfies other objectives at the same time. For us especially, it's to go even further with this idea of patch management and responding to the variability within the stand as you work your way through it. But for other people, it's also been exciting to do better natural disturbance simulation, all the other goals that people have talked about when advocating for irregular shelter wood. And important in the Ontario context, and one of the reasons I spent so much time on what about single tree and uniform, is that it feels like a safe continuum. I think Ontario hardwood management culture is quite conservative and irregular shelter wood in the way that I'm describing it doesn't feel too far away. Okay, but there are some problems. Um, one of those is there's a Ralph Nyland article from about 2010. I don't know if anybody else has seen it, but he somewhat uh, grumpily and indirectly attacks irregular shelter wood as just being a seemingly new method. Everything that we're doing can be represented by existing and well-trodden modifications to the uniform shelter wood system. And uh, Tony D'Amato, who is a positive advocate for irregular shelter wood, has cautioned that we need to prevent making irregular shelter wood the catch-all classification for anything that departs from our other, other systems. And these are valid criticisms. Um, you know, one of the, if we're not being specific enough or we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater, we risk leaving the rigor behind and making sure that this is a proper subcultural system that actually achieves the core objectives that we need it to do. Um, when this got, is getting circulation in Ontario, you know, really common criticism, particularly from some of the luminaries on the Ontario Tree Marking Committee, is, well, it all sounds very nice on paper, but how do you actually manage the system? How are you gonna audit the tree marking? How are you gonna validate the regeneration success outside of the context of an experiment? Um, how are you gonna forecast the next entry? How are you gonna put this into your growth and yield model? Um, 
and there are no short and immediate answers to any of those questions. So if we're going to solve these things and we're going to see the system applied more widely and actually achieving our objectives, we've got to put some principles behind it, put some rigor on it. So where do we start with the Halliburton Forest? What are the easy things to agree on? Now we've arrived at the final part of my presentation, which is what are we actually doing on our property. So this is a shelterwood system, first and foremost. A lot of people have viewed a regular shelterwood as a way to continue managing the overstory, continue to do partial cutting of the overstory. And that's just the means to the end. This is a shelterwood system. We're developing and releasing advanced regeneration. Uh, it is patch focused. So that means you're gonna, each patch has a unique condition and it's gonna receive a unique treatment. Um, and that means that the regeneration or your reserves might be or will be you know, spatially variable over multiple entries. And finally, the economics of it for us, trees are a crop. The goal is to grow and harvest better trees. We want to conserve our immature growing stock where we find on the landscape. We don't want to uniformly whack things out, but we also want to thin them as they come up and we want to harvest them as soon as they mature. And in the context of a shelterwood, as soon as we've achieved our regeneration, we want to get that overwood out of there. We don't want to retain it for longer than is necessary. And we're going to retain our ecological legacies as well. The ecology of this is a whole other presentation. Um, I want to dwell on this multi-patch idea for a little bit, and I'm actually just going to skip to the next slide here to demonstrate. So this is an article from Luce and Meek from 2014. This is a really excellent primer on this idea of the multi-treatment approach, which is that you're working your way through the stand, and each condition you encounter every 25 meters might be unique, and each condition requires a unique treatment. And this is a flow chart that these folks developed, and they could give, and they did, both to a tree marker to apply as they come upon each stat, patch within the stand, but they also get, could give to a feller buncher operator, and they could and did have a feller buncher operator follow and apply this flow chart every 25 meter patch. And basically, it works your way through, and at each patch, you're going to apply one of those four treatments that's listed at the bottom. This is just a concept. You can substitute whatever parameters and whatever resulting treatments you'd like in your prescription. The point is that it gets back to this rigor idea. You could, this provides a framework by which you can predict, um, audit, or constrain the treatments and the variety that you're going to encounter within these highly variable stands while still achieving those principles I just mentioned. Um, this introduces obviously a major problem, which is that doing the optimal treatment at the patch level is gonna make it harder to manage things optimally at the stand level. The basic issue here is basically time. If you do a regeneration cut in one patch, you'd like to be back there as soon as you can to release the regeneration as soon as it's up a free to grow height, that's maybe 10 years. If right next to it in another patch you've just done a final removal and you're not going to have any commercial volume to go back into for 60 years, your stand is, is out of whack. And if you do enough of that final removal cutting uh, within a single stand, maybe your stand is not carrying the commercial volume that's going to allow you to go back and do your short rotation entries. And that means that that regeneration cut, what, are you going to hold on to that for 60 years? This is not going to work. If you uh, really were managing the risk of time here which is that every, we need to set a sensible return entry for each patch that also works for this stand. And this has been a complicated thing for a lot of folks to wrap their heads around because they're working at two different principles. The short, the short version is we're in, a, we're in a loop and when we wanna know what, the, what treatments we're gonna apply at a patch level, that's gonna tell us what our ideal return interval is gonna be and when we can come back to the entire stand. And then using that information, help constrain the treatments we're gonna make in the present day. Talking in a little bit of a circle here, uh, the short, let me try to summarize this slide by saying that increased time equals increased risk. We want our returns to be as short as commercially practic practical. We want to, and we wanna be sure that we're gonna have the commercial volume to come, come back. Um, I've got a joke here about the Price is Right and Bob Barker. Let's just skip that and move on because I kind of garbled this slide. Oh no, okay, we'll go with this. So you need to, the main point, most important point is you need to know when you're gonna come back. And if you've interpreted a regular shelter with as a free thinning approach, or as you're gonna do multi-treatment, whatever you want from patch to patch, you're gonna fall down at the stand level. 
So we need to employ some extra principles, and this is what we're doing at Halliburton Forest to try to solve these problems. Um, the, and these are the three sort of joint tools that we're working with together to make this thing actually work and have it fit within our, our overall forest management package. The first is we've tweaked how we do stand inventory. And the stand inventory is more focused towards um, identifying the patch-to-patch -patch variance. It's more interested in that rather than stand-wide metrics. The second is that um, despite it being called a regular shelter wood and people taking it in all sorts of different directions, we need to sort of funnel that into a nice consistent pathway for what the treatments are going to look like, much like uh, the slides that Steve Bernard presented. Mm. And we need to actually implement each treatment. You need a rigorous prescription and treatment direction that is allowing things to be audited and to track what's happening over time. All right, so the stand inventory. Um, the emphasis is on the frequency of conditions encountered and what you would like to apply to them. It is not as important to worry about average stand metrics. Um, at each plot, you're going to apply a flow chart, much like that Lucier and Meek one that I applied, you know, custom to your forest, um, that's going to tell you how to manage each patch. So I arrive at this plot, it's a single tree selection suitable plot. I arrive at another plot, oh, this is ready for a final removal, etc., etc. And uh, this action approach is described by Bill Leek in the Silver Culture Guide for the Northeast. So people want to go design this for themselves. So here's a former version of what a stand analysis might look like. Uh, you might have a total BA of 24 meters squared, an AGS of 11 meters squared a hectare. This is very typical for Ontario. You might have some regeneration data. Well, you should have some regeneration data in addition to this. And this is what we're proposing either as a total replacement or as a supplement. Um, instead, what's more interesting is that despite the fact that the stand as a whole might be eligible for single tree selection, only 30% of the plots themselves qualified for single tree selection, and in almost half of the plots, what you actually want to be doing is a shelter with regeneration cut. You can use this distri frequency distribution to forecast the results of a multi-treatment thinning. If you gave your tree markers a flow chart, you threw them in there, you know that by and large you're going to be seeing a regeneration and cut with these roughly these proportions of the other things out there on the landscape. Um, you can also use this if you see a problem with one of those percentages, you can start to constrain it. So that brings us to the next thing. You need a clear roadmap. Using the previous slide, to take this stand as an example, okay, the, dom the most com there's lots of things happening, it's a highly variable stand, but the most common treatment is a shelter with regeneration cut. So okay, we're at the stage of doing irregular, an irregular regeneration cut. And by the way, getting ahead of myself, we call our, this whole thing an extended multi-treatment shelter wood with groups and reserves. It's primarily under the extended shelter wood system, but we have generous incorporation of groups and reserves, and multi-treatment means we patch and distribute these things across the stem. The example stand that I pr provided is going to be in either regular regeneration treatment. We know we want to be back there as soon as possible, so it's totally acceptable that we do perhaps up to 10% removal cutting as we work our way through the stem. If, however, you'd found that your removal cutting was threatening to be up around 30 or 40 percent, you're worried about your commercial volumes next time, you could use some perhaps area-based regulation to make sure that you're going to still have a commercial volume to come back at the next entry. Um, which leads us into how do you actually implement this thing. Um, you need to have super clear marking direction or operator thinning direction, depending on your circumstances. Um, the marking direction has a clear sequence, sequence for selecting the treatments in each patch. You know, it's, whether it's that flowchart that I provided from Lucia Yamik or it's something else. Um, when you arrive at each treatment, the tree marker or the operator has successfully selected the correct treatment to apply. Um, you then have standards for what does a commercial thinning look like, what does a final removal look like, what's your ecological legacies, etc. And then that makes it actually quite simple to audit the marking. The biggest criticism in Ontario has been how do you audit this thing? And if you follow a pathway like this, there are no issues to it. Um, and you can set stand-wide area targets and have this thing be constrained so that you don't do more than, if you're interested in uh, continuous cover, for example, that you don't do more than 30% uh, removal cutting or groups in a single entry. And it all sort of starts to stick together. However, um, now that I've introduced BA targets, now that I've introduced area regulation, this is starting to sound either a lot like just conventional uniform shelter wood, or it might be sounding a lot like um, 
group shelter would that you might find out of Nyland's text textbook. And I want to illustrate this point with just a couple more slides. I'll finish approximately on time. So this is an excerpt from the Quebec Silviculture Guide. This is the chapter on irregular shelter woods. I think this is from 2013. And if I can draw your attention to the bottom section, this is for irregular extended shelter wood. And the secondary cutting, so your removal cutting, your first removal cutting happens five to 10 years after the seeding cut, and they retain less between four and six meters squared a hectare. That's actually faster, and it's more uniform with less retention than the status quo for a uniform shelter wood in Ontario right now. Um, again, everything depends on, on where you're coming from, and there's a real continuum of these things, and it makes it hard, unless we're, with the labels we're using, to actually know what we're talking about and what we're proposing doing. Um, if I can make a point as well on the irregular continuous cover variant, the cutting interval of 30 to 40 years, there in Ontario, again on the Bancroft Minute, there are some selection stands that are on intervals of, of 40 years. The, how different are these things from each other? The continuum exists. Um, you know, we can get into the nuances, uh, other than the fact that I'm starting to run out of time. Uh, you can get into the weeds and really articulate how one thing is changing um, from one to the other, just exactly what you're proposing to do that's precisely different. But the more important thing I want to argue is that there's a culture shift that's associated with these changes. And this culture shift is the last idea I want to share. Um, this is from the 2015 Ontario Silviculture Guide. The ideas in it are, are pretty old. Um, and articulates group selection. So you can do single tree selection with groups. Those groups are generally meant to recruit mid-tolerance like black cherry or yellow birch. And it says that you can have five to 20% of the total area in these groups. And these are groups of say 0.15 to 0.2 hectares in size, depending on your target species. And uh, in my experience wandering in Ontario, I have never seen a selection, a single tree selection or a single tree selection with group stand that has more than 2% of its area in mid-tolerant groups. We've had this tool in our toolbox to do this respond to variability and to do this irregularity thing, and nobody's used it. And it's not because we've lacked um, permission or the right framework to get this thing done, it's because there hasn't been a cultural focus on, on introducing these elements into our stands and into our management. Um, you know, calling, uh, there's an, a value and an appeal in calling this whole thing a regular shelter wood and leaning into the principles of play and simply saying, this is the point, do this thing. The point is to create gaps. We want to see gaps. The matrix is just the filler. The, the point is to release the regeneration and the good opportunities that we find in the woods. Um, this is my final favorite example. This is my last slide. Um, but this slide on the right, this is a real stand from the French Severn Forest. Uh, we're really lucky in central Ontario to have red spruce, which is typically an Acadian species. And uh, you can see we've got an excellent patch of red spruce regeneration underneath a pretty dense overstory of sugar maple. Nothing in the prescription called for identifying or doing anything with this red spruce regeneration. Nothing in the tree marking or operational thinning released this red spruce or favored it in any way. And it wasn't because we had the lack of silvicultural tools, it's because we didn't have the cultural focus that getting this stuff moving before we lose it to some competition is really what we need to do. Um, we've got to de-emphasize our really conservative focus on how we manage the overstory. We've got to find the good pockets of regen that are out there, and we've got to do this across our civil cultural systems, not just in a regular shelter. But I will end it there. All right, thanks, Thomas. Questions? Thomas? Really good, thank, thank you. you. Question quickly, I, I'm intrigued with the approach to doing a seeding cut or a generation cut, as opposed, like when you spoke to the challenges of coming back to remove the overstory and these gaps that you've done a preceding, you know, in the classical terminology, seeding cut or regeneration cutting, shelter cutting, as opposed to just cutting a hole. Mm. Right, like so if you could just cut a hole, you wouldn't have to come back to take the overstory off that hole. You might expand it if you wanted more light. But by doing your mini seeding cuts, you know, mini you know, mini regeneration cuts in those gaps, it's requiring you to go back to the 
I'm just wondering why why you do that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The uh, so Bob Seymour is a really great advocate and has an excellent webinar for the yeah. about expanding gap of regular shelter wood, and he advocates exactly that. Don't touch the matrix; just focus on your your gaps. There's two reasons for it. Um, one is that in if we go actually we go back. Okay, so you see that the uh, in the Quebec guide it calls for a higher standard for AGS growing stock in the ex on the continuous cover variance. If you're doing expanding gap like that, your total your total regeneration period is going to be longer than what I'm proposing, and increased time equals increased risk. In these areas we want to put our gaps where we've got regeneration, but in the right. matrix where we're looking for regeneration, we want to bring it on faster, and we want to get our high risk overwood out of there. Like we're typically carrying, um, you know, four to eight meters squared of unacceptable growing stock, semi-mature or mature right. overstory. Uh, we don't want to leave that out there a year longer than is absolutely necessary to get our region coming along. Yeah, you know, you're talking about the group selections and such, and uh, that's really important. But the point is that uh, after the second entry, you pretty much. You can speak to this. Should you do like expanding gap? Because nobody's really mentioned that end of it. Because it, whether you're relying on the, the main the matrix to, to fall apart at the edge, or when you get that region, and you don't want just a spot in the middle. To, yeah. So you, both, of you could both of you could respond to that if you like. Sure. I'll jump first, and if I do a bad job, Steve and Patricia can take over. I think I think you can do you can place and the and. Place, uh, you can place your initial gaps. The initial gaps should be, are going to be placed where you have existing regeneration. And then your subsequent gaps, well, if we go with the really simplistic version of what I've proposed, so your first, your first entry is going to, be, going to be gaps. And then your next entry is going to be, if it goes well, is going to be the balance of the stand. Um, so, because again, the point is we're talking about low quality stands with with an with a unacceptable growing stock mature component that we want to get out of there, and you're going to leave retention across that matrix, but but that's the idea. If that's if that does not go according to plan, you can expand your gaps, you can place new gaps, you can roll in there with the herbicide treatment to control your beach understory, whatever the situation may be. But um, one thing I'm not interested in prescribing is how exactly where exactly those gaps should be placed. Yeah.